Now, we are going to be talking to Michael Rose, the boss of Tourmaline Oil on BNN, and that's set for today, very shortly, 10 past noon uh, Eastern time. Okay, well, let's get to the fusion energy story. A fusion reactor of MIT just set a significant record. Uh, the reactor generated the highest plasma pressure ever recorded, but it's kind of bittersweet because the U.S. Department of Energy says it uh, will no longer be able to provide funding for this reactor. We're joined now by Martin Greenwald, Deputy Director at MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center. He's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Martin, great to see you. Well, thank you, and good morning. And so just remind us, we know that fusion energy, it's the, t the process that stars use to generate energy, and the dream is nuclear power without waste, for example. Exactly. So, so our goal is to harness fusion as a practical energy source, in particular to address the problem of climate change, since it's a carbon-free source of energy. Now, plasma, just remind us what plasma is, because you're talking about creating massive temperatures in your device. Exactly. Um, so when you, it's, plasma is really the fourth state of matter. When you, when you heat material, it starts as a solid. Uh, as it gets hotter, it turns to a liquid, then a gas, and finally to a plasma. Um, in, the, in the experiment that we just um, finished running, we can reach temperatures up to 100 million degrees. Um, and this is really quite an accomplishment, and it's it's been part of a program that's been carried out worldwide over over a, you know many decades mm -hmm. uh, to bring us to this point. It's been a tough nut to crack, though, isn't it? I mean, human beings have been working on on yes. fusion for decades. It's it's a hard problem, but the but the payoff is huge because it's it's an essentially unlimited energy source that doesn't produce any of the ordinary chemical pollutants and. Um, compared to renewables like wind or solar, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it could plug into the existing electrical grid without any uh, dislocations or problems. So it, it, the, the, the promise and the difficulty both go together. No. But we're, we're actually quite optimistic about, about where we're headed. But, but just before we get back to you guys, in, in France, uh, a whole bunch of nations have teamed up on a gigantic fusion project. Can you tell us a bit about that? Okay, that's the ITER experiment, and it's being built by a consortium of nations that includes Europe and the United States, Japan, Russia, China, India, and Korea. So a good part of the developing developed world. Um, it's a very large and expensive project. Um, the, the exact price is hard to mm -hmm. compute because of the different cost structures and finances of different countries. But, you know, it's at least $20, $30 billion. Um, it's been very slow to get off the ground. And this is in part because it involves so many different parties with different um, uh, cultures and different ways of uh, approaching large projects and, and the need for agreement. So it probably will not be carrying out the few the, the important fusion experiments for uh, almost 20 years 20 years but right the, your own reactor though at MIT it lost its funding as of September 30th uh, that sounds disappointing uh, yeah in, in part I think as you know it was sacrificed in order to help pay for uh, that very large project um, but we really view it as you know, the end of a chapter, not the end of the story. And we think one of the things that the results that we produced show is it, is it validates a, a somewhat different approach than is being taken by ITER and the rest of the world. And that is to stress operating these machines at very high magnetic field. Mm -hmm. um, we use magnetic fields in order to insulate this plasma, you know, which is at hundreds of millions of degrees from ordinary matter. You know, you obviously have to keep those two apart. And we do that with strong magnetic fields. And what we've shown is that the stronger the magnetic field, the better you do in, in terms of that insulation. You know, if you, if you draw the analogy to improved insulation in the walls of your house, if you improve the quality of that insulation, uh, you can use less of it and, um, and the walls don't have to be so thick. And the same thing here, if we have higher magnetic field, the machines can be a lot smaller. 
So we're, we're actually very uh, eager to pursue that approach. And there are some breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs that didn't come from our program, but that offer the possibility of a, a sort of game-changing approach to fusion. Um, mm -hmm. And that is the development of these uh, high-temperature superconductors. You know, you might have heard of them in science news over the last decades. Uh, there was a Nobel Prize awarded mm -hmm. some years ago. But they're out of the labs now and, and uh, into industrial maturity. You, you know, you can buy them online on Alibaba if, if you want. Um, <laughs> So that's pretty available, and and with those with that new technology, was which was not available when ITER was designed, you could build a machine with comparable performance at about one tenth the size of ITER. Martin, and, and wait, Martin, it's an amazing story, and, and we wish you you and your colleagues well, and we hope that you um, line line up funding soon. I mean, what sources can you go to the private sector here? We, are, we have started talking to the private sector as well as to the U.S. government, and, and the reaction so far has been positive. Um, so we're hopeful that, um, that, that that approach will have some resonance, some traction, mm -hmm. and that we'll be able to get on with the job, because we think this is really critical for humanity. We need uh, alternate energy sources, and fusion has a lot of promise as, as being part of that mix. Um, what about Elon Musk or the, the guys at Google? Uh, you must have approached them anyway. I mean, it sounds like they're kind of wheelhouse. Well, we, we are talking to people, you know, uh, in, in the sort of um, venture philanthropy space. Um, I won't get into, you know, exactly who we've approached and talked to, but um, there are many people with, with resources who are, who are eager to to, to apply the money they've made um, mm -hmm. to, to you know, the betterment of humanity. And, and so we're hoping that, again, there's some resonance and traction and, and uh, that allow us to proceed. I mean, it's interesting, you talk about billions needed for this, but of course the, the fossil fuel industry invests trillions every year. Uh, it, it's certainly true. I mean, the mismatch between, and, and not just for fusion, the mismatch between the scale of the energy economy the challenge of global warming and the resources being applied for R&D to solve it are really striking. You would think that, you know, as a, as a, you know, a, a, the developed nations, you would think would, would really be taking this on as a much more serious endeavor, but so far, not so much. Human beings uh, tend yeah. to be in denial about stuff. Martin, thank you so much yeah, for joining us. Term.